Welcome to Keep It Weird, the podcast for all things strange and unusual, mysterious and eerie, psychic and psychological, and everything in between. Each week we have the pleasure of getting together and chatting about something weird. Weird. You're not going to know which way is up this week because we are flipping your world upside down. We've got a terrifying technology update, a mysterious missing person case that may not be all that it seems, some killer weather, and the impossible discovery of a 500-year-old body that could only be explained by the paranormal. Y'all better make sure your seatbelts are fastened and your tray tables are locked in their upright position because the air pressure in this cabin is about to drop. My name is Ashley, and this is my co-host, Lauren. Hello, weirdos. Hello. (laughs) That was a really great opening. I'm repping goth yearbook today. You are. I love that shirt. Yeah, it's my favorite. I wear it all the time. Yeah, it's one of my favorite, like, I mean, wear everywhere shirts, but to sleep in because it's just so comfy, cozy, and it's oversized, like the best way to have a shirt. (laughs) It's good. Yeah, you guys really killed it. With your merch. I don't know if you can um, see my sweatshirt says friends don't let friends Vanderpump alone. And so true. as true. Ashley and I never let each other watch alone. But the funny thing is, like Vanderpump is so trendy right now, of course, because of Scandaval, but I have had this sweatshirt since 2016. So let it be known. Yeah. The real ones are here. And that's all. <laughs> <laughs> the real ones. We're we're out here. I we out is here. the reunion airing this week. Tomorrow night or Thursday, like on Peacock, will be part one. It's three parts, so we we're in for another three weeks of this mess. Yeah, there's so many weird theories going around online. Weirdos, if you haven't been keeping up with Vanderpump Rules, buy Peacock, buy Peacock, buy the station. No, subscribe to Peacock. Truly. And get caught up. There's only like nine or ten seasons. You should be caught up anytime. Um, Easy. In a day. <laughs> before we get into it, I did want to say don't forget we have a brand new tier available on our Patreon for 50 Bones. You can sponsor a segment on our show. You get to name the segment, choose the topic we discuss for that segment, and your name and a short message will be featured on the episode. And mm-hmm. if you have any fun ideas on an opening jingle, we'd be happy to hear that as well. So we love that. We love, love a jingle. It. We want anyway, your creativity. Anyway, we told you all about it last week. It's in this month's newsletter, and there's a public post about it on our Patreon at www.patreon.com slash keep it weird podcast. So head there if you want to know more. We have so much this week that we are going to hop right into it. Lauren is starting us off. Lord. Okay, I'm going to kick it off with true crime then, I think, which I haven't done yet this season. And I know we sort of changed how we do true crime and for good reason. Mm -hmm. But uh, I first for this segment want to sing how I would like the true crime time song to be because it's what I say in my head every time I write it on our newsletter. (laughs) I say, what time is it? True crime time. It's a vacation from High School Musical, which makes no sense. But Oh, I didn't know that. You could have fooled me. You could have been like, I made it up on my own. I wrote it. I know. I should have gone along with it, except that all of the you listeners have. would have commented known. and been like, oh, High School Musical. And by all the listeners, maybe like 5% of them, because I don't know if I was anyone say. else came. Anyway, so anyway. true crime time. We... <laughs> are going to be talking about an older case as is going to be the case with all the true crime it's it's older but it's also unsolved but when i get to the end of this like we know we know what's going on you'll see what i mean but it's it's still we're gonna know but it's still just like a weird ass story and i actually put like the tiniest most vague blurb on our newsletter in true crime time and it's what inspired this to be where I was like I want to take a deep dive I don't just want three sentences on this so here we are okay so this is the case of Teresa Ann Beer um she went missing and nobody knows what happened but let's start at the beginning because her life sucked 
unfortunately. Damn. She was born in 1971 to her parents, Shirley and David, good old Shirley and David Beer. And they were, she was actually taken from her parents at a young age due to their horrific abuse. And yeah. she was placed in the foster care system, at least along with her sister. So she had a sibling. But a few years later, David Beer filed for divorce from Shirley and then wanted to have custody back of Teresa. And he had a new wife named Margie Richmond, who was also abusive towards Teresa. No surprise that, you know, he has a type. And unfortunately, she was ended up, she ended up in his custody temporarily, horrifically abused, and then ended up in her uncle's custody in Fresno, California. Things were slightly better for her for a little while, but then the uncle's drunk friends started coming over horrific she experienced a lot of abuse of different kinds all throughout her life is mostly what we are summarizing here um God. she was also forced to skip school and babysit other children that the uncle would be like taking care of she just like she wasn't given any kind of routine or normal life and at 16 years old when the events of this case took place Teresa was said to be a slow learner very immature and tended to act out in school which like Homegirl has been through some trauma, so I don't yeah, blame her. Yeah, of course. Her. She hasn't been getting a proper education. She had protruding upper teeth, um, bad hygiene, and she was very small. She was 5'5", five, five, like 110 pounds, maybe slightly under, just not taken care of in any way. And unfortunately, that's really all there is to say about her because she just wasn't really given a chance. We don't know what her dreams were. Nothing. But, um... So she was failed many times, and then she went missing with a guy named Russell Skip Welch, which I already hate hmm. anyone who has Skip in their name. It just makes me feel uncomfortable. What about Skip, Skip Shoemaker? Well, all right. Skip's not always bad. <laughs> but... <laughs> He's the hottest cardinal of all time. How I guess that's you? true. For whatever reason, when it's an athlete, maybe that's it. I can accept Skip and an athlete, but when it's an older guy who's like, I'm going to hang out with a 16-year-old, and my name is Russell Skilp, Skip, Skilp, Russell Skip, Skilp. Welch, I'm not here for it. Skilp. Okay, so, Russell Welch, age 43, he was neighbors of the beers in Fresno, California, and he was a self-proclaimed Bigfoot expert. So, when you hear this, oh. you're kind of like... He's You're like, one of us. she's in good hands. <laughs> we love a weirdo. <laughs> we love people into Bigfoot. Um, he loved talking about Bigfoot. He was intent on finding evidence of the creature in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And he was also a house painter who lived off disability checks and also was allegedly a meth addict as well. So you know what? Uh, Variety. Well, I like a man with interests. <laughs> I know. Like, we like a well-rounded, dipping his toe in everything. <laughs> Uh, kind of guy. So this is where I'm like, this is what sucks about Teresa not having anybody looking out for her because at some point, Welch asked if he could take Teresa out camping with him in the mountains to go lurk, look and learn more about Bigfoot or Sasquatch because he was so interested and she had expressed interest. And her uncle was just like, yeah, sure. Yeah, like, why I, not? I've heard you might. 43 year old man into the who woods. Could be a meth addict. Why? Who? Like, not doing anything good. The uncle knew all about this guy, but was still like, sure. He's twice her age, all of the things. So it's not any surprise because her family was terrible, but she was allowed to go, even with the dangers. So on the morning of June 1st, 1987, so also timely because this date is coming up again. June yeah. 1st, Welch picked up Teresa, and he reportedly told the uncle he was going to drop her off at school, and then he would pick her up after, but instead of taking her to school, they just went straight to the mountain. So she didn't get go to school yet again. And they went to a place called Shut Eye Peak, about 25 miles north of Bass Lake, and I guess it was a decent drive and kind of in like a remote, creepy area where people tend to go missing. Sure. So... They're going to search for Bigfoot. Later that morning, Teresa's uncle gets a call from Central High School to report that Teresa never made it to school. And the uncle is sort of just like, maybe I misunderstood what he said he was going to do. I mean, I know they're going camping. Maybe he was leaving sooner. So he at first was like, whatever. But then later that night, after talking to a few other people, thank the good Lord, I have to give credit where credit is due. He was convinced to actually be concerned and called authorities at 930 p.m. that night saying, I 
don't feel good about what's happening with this guy. Like, I, I just want to make sure nothing crazy is happening. So he told authorities and actually reported Teresa missing, which feels a little weird since he said she could go on the camping trip. But again, he was just worried. So yeah. they go out looking for, you know, neighbors are looking for, people are trying to get in touch with Welch, find clues, anything. And then Welch just returns to Fresno like four days later and Teresa's not with him. No sign of the 16 year old and nobody had been able to get a hold of Welch. And then he just appears and authorities, you know, show up and say like, what's going on? And so as Fresno where's police are child? talking to him and his family, yeah, where's the kid? Um, Welch's daughter said that she had seen her father and a young girl. She has a strange relationship with him, but she was around the house at the time. She had seen her father and a young girl, likely Teresa, on June 1st before they'd headed off to go camping. And another friend of Welch's said that Welch had said Teresa was taken by a satanic group and he had nothing to do with it. So he just headed on home once she was captured by the Satan. Classic. Okay. Classic. He was just like, He's, I'm going to go home and take a hot bubble bath. Uh, Satanists I, just really give me the heebie-jeebies. That, yeah, I just, I can't deal Hope with them today. Okay. I'm exhausted. I've been camping. I'm going to go take a shower. We'll figure this out later. So, yeah, he comes home casually and is like, oh, she's still being held up there in the Sierra Nevadas. But, like, it wasn't me. So people are starting to talk and be like, I don't know. I don't know about this guy. It's not adding up. And then on June 5th, Welch's brown Monte Carlo was spotted and law enforcement, um, it was spotted in a weird location. And so they went to talk to him again of like, why is your car here so far from your home? Why is it parked so terrible? Um, and he was like wasted when they were talking to him and they're like, oh, probably because you were drunk driving and parked it over here. So come in for that. And they were like, we needed to get him on something anyway. Anything. So they bring him in, they're talking to him and he just keeps saying like, no, I, I took her to school. I don't know what everyone's talking about. Like I took her to school, like I said, and then we, then we went camping and blah, blah, blah. But his story changed every time. Like first it was that. Then it was, oh, no, I dropped her off at school and we never made it to camping. Then it was we did go camping, but she was taken by Satanists. Then it was like we got back down to the bottom of the mountain and then she went missing when I was putting gas in my car. Like, Gee, the, I wonder if guy. this guy did something nefarious. <laughs> it's awful. So the authorities go to the spot where the supposed abduction had occurred when he said this is where she was taken. He led them into the woods and said this was the spot. And there was no evidence in the slightest that anything had happened there. No clothes, no prints, no blood. And searches were carried out in that whole area of Shed Eye Peak. Nothing was found. Then they are taken to a campsite. I'm saying it with finger quotes if you are right. just listening to this audio. Um, a campsite where he and Teresa had been. And there was a large burned area and some blankets were hung up in a weird formation and blah, blah, blah. But apparently this was a campsite that he staged. Like he staged a campsite and was like, this is it. Nothing is really going on. And after a search, after kind of being like this, something feels weird about it. His behavior's off and this campsite doesn't look like it's like actually been used or that anybody was here. They find the real campsite about 20 miles away in an area called Ghost Canyon that area was searched, and then they found a blue shirt belonging to Welch that had meth in the pocket hmm. and a shoe that they didn't know who it belonged to. So later that June, Welch was finally arrested and charged with child stealing, as they called it at the time, similar to kidnapping, child endangerment. Right. And he was originally released, um, or no, he was released and then rearrested later that night with a higher bail. Because he was able to get out, like, he paid for his own bail. And I just learned this recently on TikTok, actually. You can pay your own bail if it's under a certain amount, which I always just assumed somebody had to bail you out. Did you know that? What do you mean you can pay, like, you yourself can be like, here's my debit card? Bail yourself out. Yeah, like, I have the funds. I thought yeah, it I figured, had to be somebody else. I figured it could be your own money. Um, but what I didn't know... Is that you could be arrested, they could place a bail on you, you could pay that bail, and then they could arrest you again and give you a higher bail. I did not I know, know that. I don't know if you can do that anymore, to be okay. clear, because again, <laughs> be this fair. was a while ago, because kidnapping was referred to as 
like child stealing also. Right. So things could have changed. But at the time, they were able to do this. And then they made it a higher bail that he was not able to pay himself, which... Again, I didn't realize there was a limit until nope. recently. So he's back in. And then later that year in September 1987, he is finally about to go to trial for these charges. He's just been sitting in jail because nobody wants to bail this fool out. And when it's about to go to trial, Welch is released from prison because authorities have realized there's just not enough evidence here. So they could not get a conviction. They didn't believe it should go to trial anymore. They thought it's going to be a waste of everyone's time. So they were just like, we got to let this guy go. And because of the double jeopardy clause of the Fifth Amendment, no person, you know, shall be subject for the same offense. So he can't be tried twice for the same crime. And if authorities went to court on murder charges and were unable to prove, you know, they didn't want to get caught in that, which I do understand. But there is just... They couldn't get any more kind of evidence because, again, you know, this isn't in the early 2000s where, like, things have started to advance. They just... Yeah, there were no security cam them. footage of no, them or the No cameras. A... No nothing. No, like, phone calls that they could trace. So it was just sort of like, I guess we're out of luck. And her body has never been found, which is the mysterious part of it. Like, what happened to the body? And I would really like to know that. However... I'm like, even without the body, I just, I think it's so hard for me to wrap my head around how there still isn't enough evidence, but I guess you really do have to find, you know, like a bloody, bloody clothing or something. But. Well, I mean, I don't understand why there wasn't enough evidence to charge him with the kidnapping because mm -hmm. they knew that he, and like child endangerment, because even if, even if he took her out to the woods and she was kidnapped by Satanists. He mm -hmm. still took her out to the took her from her uncle, her caregiver, lied mm -hmm. about where he was taking her, and then she never came home. I still feel like that's right. a pretty solid case for child endangerment. Well, and that is that is what he was charged for was child endangerment. But then that's the thing is everyone else who knew Teresa was like, okay, child endangerment, great, yes, of course, and that's why he was sitting in prison for a very long time. And you know, I think he had to serve whatever amount of time. However, then when everyone else said, no, we need to give murder charges and he knows more than he's saying and we need to be led to her body and you need to go hard on him, that's where that's things fell apart and just it. nobody could get anything out of him. And then, of course, because of his belief in Bigfoot and, you know, all of the mysteries of the mountains and the woods, which he's not wrong about, we talk about on the show, he was just convincing everybody who questioned him, like, you know people go missing all the time and, like, bringing up all these examples, some of them being people we've heard about on Missing 411 and just saying, like, this happens. Like, this is a totally normal thing. And some people were actually starting to agree with him. He was convincing enough. And even his daughter, who had a strange relationship with him, was like, hey, this guy's capable of a lot of things, believe me, but I don't know that he's a murderer. Murder so, is not one of them. Like, I don't know. He was starting to convince people. And so that's another reason that this just was like Teresa was failed immediately. But and I know it is strange that her body was never found. So I will yeah. say, like, I can give a little bit of a shrug. But just the way he came back home to Fresno and was like, what? It was just like, eh, woof. camping <sighs> takes a lot camping. out of you. I know. Che cheese and crackers, guys. And then they were like, where's the girl you took with you? Mm-hmm. And then and the he's like, who knows? That... The woods are mysterious. <laughs> but then also <laughs> changing a story to like, what? I never even picked her up. Or like, yeah, just, I mean, he I very can't. obviously did something. Which is why I don't consider this a mystery. But it's just, it's sad. And I mean, I will say she is, since a body has never been found, she is still missing. And that was part of the reason that I... Brought this story up because, you know, this happened in California. So any of our California listeners, Fresno area, if you know anything about this, if you know anyone discussed in here, I mean, you can still report your findings. It's still an open case. Yeah. Nobody knows where the hell she call is. Call the police so. or call us at 626-686-1821. <laughs> Ding. Ding. You know, that's something that's really sad and also really frustrating um, because so many people in this country talk about, you know, 
child predators and and they they act like it's such a big deal to them and like and sex trafficking rings and stuff and they act like it's just it's the biggest deal to them in the world and then they refuse to acknowledge the fact that almost every single case of sex trafficking and child sex abuse happens within the family within the freaking family and whether whether that's a family member who's doing the abuse or you know there are cases of like parents pimping out their children it's not necessarily that they're abusing them but they're allowed they're leaving them with people that they know are going to abuse them in exchange for drugs or money or whatever like that is what usually happens in sex trafficking cases it's not Chrissy Teigen it's not (laughs) the democratic party it's not it's 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 just really fucking bad people and i don't i don't know what the solution is to that i mean you know these people feel like they're my kids i can do what i want with them and it's like i mean no no you can't and it's crazy that people think that way but they do and Mm -hmm. like yeah Again, I'm sorry that I always refer to TikTok, but it's basically my news at this point. But again, sure. just yesterday I was watching a video of a 911 call where a woman was calling in saying like, hey, I haven't seen my husband in like two days. Like, I, I don't know what to do. He hasn't come home. I like I can't get a hold of him. I know that he left work on this night, but then he just never returned home. She's thinking the worst that like he's dead and or like yeah. anything could have happened, like got in a car accident. Nobody's reported it to her. Then they were like, well, call one of the local jails first and then we'll put out, you know, missing persons because you never know. So she calls a local jail kind of expecting nothing. And they answered and were like, oh, yeah, your husband's here. We have him on sex trafficking charges. And she just thought she had the best husband and father to her child in the world. But he had been trafficking their daughter for months. It's so hard, so hard for me to believe that she had no idea. Do you know what I mean? Same. When same. people are like, I had no idea. And way, it's like, ooh. It's sort of mm-hmm. like, remember in Vanderpump when Sheena married um, <laughs> Shay? And Shay. they got married and then she found out that he took like 10 Percocets a day and was like, had a horrible pill problem. And she's like, I didn't mm-hmm. know. And it's like, you didn't fucking know? I watched the show and I fucking knew he was on drugs. We all knew he would just sit in the corner like the whole time. We knew he was on something that he he wasn't well, but she was, she was looking the other way. Sometimes it's not even that like you're purposefully ignoring something. It's just that you're so self-involved or you're so preoccupied with something else or whatever that it really is sort of blind to you, but also open your fucking eyes and pay attention to what's going on around you. Holy shit. Truly, open your damn eyes. Pay attention to your children. I guarantee your daughter showed signs of abuse. That's what makes me really sad. And I think it's she horrific. was really young, but... <sighs> yeah. All right. So, do you have any theories? <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, yeah, do you have any theories? Sad. Who do you think it is? Do you think it was Bigfoot Either. or Russell? Um, It was Russell. It's like 8% chance it was Bigfoot, 92% mm-hmm. chance... Russell. Absolutely. I'll give it that. I'll go with Russell. Okay. Well, let's lighten it up in here. <laughs> Holy shit. Yes, please. Stop talking about child yes. sex abuse. Hold on. I, I have know. To we just went off the rails. Goodness. Okay. Now, I wasn't sure what category to put this in, and I thought about making up, um, you know, a new one, and I think I will. So this category is going to be our psychic category. So call 1-800-MISS CLEO and get your psychic reading. We'll tell you all about, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I can do, I feel like, first of all, like for a second I was like, that's racist. And then I was like, no, because her accent was fake too. So yes. I'm not it was doing never a Jamaican real accent. dialect. I'm doing a Miss Cleo dialect, which is a fake dialect yes. that she did. A fake trying to be Jamaican <laughs> accent. So yeah, I don't think <laughs> I don't think you're in the wrong for that. So oh, it's Miss Cleo. Oh, the Ms. memories. Cleo. I would watch that late at night for hours. <laughs> Every time. Okay, so what do you know about Richard the Third? 
Not a lot, I'll be honest. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> King, king Richard the Third was the King of England from 1483 to 1485 when he was murdered. His um, defeat and death in the Wars of the Roses marked the end of the Middle Ages in England. And he's actually the very last English king to ever die in battle. So he's the very last royal um, from England to ever die in battle. His reign was also extremely short. So it is kind of weird that people still talk about him today. But there are parts of his story that are super fascinating. So I kind of get it. Like, for example, he may be responsible for the greatest missing persons case in British history. What happened was... This is exciting. <laughs> it was kind of controversial when Richard III took the reign because he actually seized the crown from his young nephew, Edward V. Now, Edward was only 12 years old when his father, Edward IV, died. Edward V was next in line for the crown, and Richard III was named Lord Protector of the Realm of Edward IV. But That's right before... Edward was crowned in 1483. The marriage of his parents was called into question. They called it bigamous and therefore invalid, which means Edward V no longer had royal blood. Ooh. So all Sorry. of their children were barred from inheriting the throne, and Richard III was named the rightful king. So okay. Edward V and his younger brother, Richard of Shrewsbury, Duke of York, uh, were seen once in August of 1483 and then never seen again. They Ooh. were nicknamed the Princes in the Tower because some people believe the young boys were being kept in prison in the tower of the castle. Others believed that King Richard had them murdered, especially after Richard III's death and the Tudor dynasty was established and there was still no sign of these two boys. So Shady. they thought he killed him, but some others still believe that the missing and murdered boy story was total Tudor propaganda meant to further blacken the reputation of the former king. Drama, drama, Ooh. drama. This is why we call it palace drama. intrigue, okay? This is why we have the crown. This is why we love the royals. <laughs> I know. This is delicious. This is delicious Delectable. tea. This is how tea, okay. <laughs> the phrase of spilling the tea should be used mm -hmm. in this sense because it's royal. It's tea, tea time. Tea. So Tea time, baby. That's not even the reason I want to talk about him today. When Richard III oh. <laughs> was killed in battle, his corpse was taken to the nearby town of Leicester and buried without a ceremony at a local friary. And now, every time I've told this story since I did the research, which has been twice, I've said friary, and no one has realized that I was saying, like, friar, F-R-I-A-R, like a monk. Right. So a friary. Uh -huh. It was like a church yard. Right. Um, I understood. And I'm an thank idiot. Thank you. So tell everybody else God. to relax. Everyone was like, like fried chicken? And I was like, no, like no. fryers, like fryer tuck. Like a fryer. Yeah, I was going to say fryer tuck. <laughs> That's what I thought of. We have a liquor store called Fryer Tuck in Peoria, Illinois, and so that's part of the reason that I will never forget the word fryer, but anyway, <laughs> you continue. Okay, so but in 1538, that friary was dissolved, and his grave was lost. No one knew where he was for over 500 years, and the way he was found is almost too crazy to believe. Like, I don't even know what to think of it. So... In 2012, the president of the Richard III Society, Philippa Langley, was on a trip to Leicester in order to find more clues of the location of Richard III's remains, if they existed at all, because the records from the time were pretty sparse. Right. Yes. Scarce? Didn't have much. Sparse. Scarce. Scarce. Spar it's either sparse. scarce or sparse, right? Sparse? <laughs> sparse. And I think... They mean similar things, right? <laughs> but recently, they had found living descendants of Richard III and had DNA samples at the ready to make any connection they could find. So maybe they found long-lost relatives. Maybe they found, you know, clothes. Like, they didn't know what they were going to find, but they wanted to try and figure out where his body could be if it was still around. Right. So at one point, 
she was meeting up with some friends, associates, whatever, and they recommended she park in a parking lot that was used by social services to meet up with them. And when she was getting out of her car, she felt very strange. And she immediately thought, I am standing on Richard's grave. But like, how can you prove it? So she just moved on with her life because what are you going to do? But a year later, it's still eating at her. She's still like, I think he's there. So a year later, she returned to the same parking lot and said the feeling was even stronger. Plus, (laughs) plus, for some reason, within that year, someone had spray painted an R over the parking space that she had parked in the prior year. No. Yeah. No. What the fuck? Langley what? somehow persuaded the Leicester City Council to allow her to hire archaeologists and conduct a dig in that parking lot. But as most things go, when it got closer to dig day, the council withdrew the funding. So Langley was so convinced, she was so positive that Richard was buried there, that she ended up publicizing the cause and she persuaded Ricardians, which is apparently what they call Richard III fans these days. <laughs> She persuaded Ricardians worldwide to donate to the dig. People are into weird shit. I don't know. Over $28,000 came in, which was enough to run the project for about two weeks. So on August 25th, 2012, a mini excavator punctured the asphalt over that parking space where she had gotten goosebumps over a year prior. And guess motherfucking what? Stop it. He was not there. They found he was there. His body. <laughs> ah! <laughs> wow. So the wow. lead, ar- <laughs> the lead archaeologist that she hired on this project, uh. put the odds at finding Richard the Third, or even the remains of the church that used to reside on the friary on that land, at a million to one, and somehow by lunchtime. On the first day, they ended up finding who they were looking for one foot to the left of where they first broke ground. Insane. Unbelievable. Like, I don't, I can't, I can't believe it. I I can't. Also, like, okay, besides this moment of getting the goosebumps over that spot, like, did this woman have other events like that where it was like, I feel a tingle. Mm-mm. It was just for Richard Ricardian, for a Richard. true Ricardian. You know? I mean, you know, she was his. She's. I mean, she was the president of the Richard the Third Society, so she's technically his biggest fan on earth. And you know what? She lived up to it, and I'm really proud of her. For that. <laughs> she did. Like, gosh, <laughs> she did the most. But that, wow. you know, that's crazy enough. <laughs> But also, really quick, Mental oh, Floss, good. the website Mental Floss, broke down exactly how many miracles had to have occurred in order for the, his body to be found. So, first, oh my gosh, yes. even though Lester had grown into a little bit of a metropolis, no new construction, aside from the parking lot, ever went up on that gravesite. Which, technically, if construction had happened in the spot, they may have found the body, but... If they had found the body 50 years earlier, we wouldn't have had the technology to make a DNA match. And who knows where those bones would have ended up or how long it would take people to realize what they had. And um, speaking of DNA, in every generation following Richard III, a female relative had at least one daughter, which kept the mitochondrial DNA alive. And the mitochondrial DNA is the only kind of DNA that goes unchanged from mother to child and is, you know, preserved down the female line indefinitely. Which Mm. is why I think it's fucking interesting that, like, when it comes to, like, royal blood, it's always, like, on the men's side. But men don't have mitochondrial DNA. It needs to, like, travel through the – anyways – Besides yeah, they're gonna the have point. a legacy. Sounds like the females <laughs> are carrying like it true to be legacy, woman to woman. But I digress. Mm. So at Whatever. this time, though, in 2012, 
and maybe still today, I'm not sure, none of Richard's living relatives have daughters. So if the project had taken place 50 years later, a DNA match would have been impossible because he may not have had any living descendants. So that body really kind of had to have been found within 100 years or less in order for us to identify it the way that we did. And it was found because the president of his fan club got tingly when she stood above his body. Like, how the fuck does this happen? How does this happen? Thank God there are Ricardians in the world. We needed this Thank God for Ricardians. I'll never be over it. I'll never be over this story. And when I said, like, it's hard to believe, I, it's literally, too, it's hard to believe, but also... It's near impossible to believe. You can't fake it either. Like, she didn't no. know. No one knew. How would she He's have, been missing for how 500 would she years. Have A parking spot, like, and that spot. that <laughs> It's like, oh, I parked here and I'm feeling it. And the R. The well, R. The R painted. <sighs> Just... I'll never be over it. No, it's a, it's a true <laughs> miracle. <laughs> uh, miracle on 34th what does it Street. Mean? That is <laughs> Miracle in Leicester. <laughs> miracle in Leicester. That is wild. And I also thank you for the education on Richard the Third because I had none. And yeah, I appreciated it. He has kind of an interesting history. You know, Shakespeare wrote about him. Um, made him kind of a monster, like not not only an evil man, but also like a really like disgusting hunchback, rat faced man. And they did find when they found his body that he did have scoliosis, but it wouldn't be enough okay. to make him a hunchback. And I think the reason that he still has a fan club or a society or whatever today is because there's like two different camps. There's a camp that's like, no, he was a monster. He killed these little boys. He was a bad person. Right. And then there's the people that are like, that was all fucking made up to make him look bad. He wasn't a bad guy, no, which like, people are just I, don't, trying to I can't imagine him. like caring that much. No. You know what I mean? About Me this either. guy who yeah. died. 500 so years ago passionate. i can't imagine being like oh <laughs> i will uh-uh. fight for him for the rest of my life <laughs> like, okay. i know i think that's what made me giggle when you said ricardians i was like there cannot be a name there can't be that many people there in a can't be club that, that there's a name people, but lo and but behold apparently there are so oh my gosh should i join this group like maybe i need to jump on board but i don't really understand the passion <laughs> no. but, hey, teach their own listen <laughs> Listen, we, we all have, have something. I won't yuck your yum, you know? No, never. London is the greatest city on earth, but its back streets and dark alleyways hold fascinating secrets of the past, most of which are tinged with sadness or sputtered with blood. Take, for example, the tragic story of Harriet Lane, found buried in an abandoned warehouse, the gruesome tale of a hangman who slit his own throat, the Queen, who was just too smelly to marry, and an argument between two doctors which led to the use of anaesthetic over hypnotism for amputations. Come and join me, your host with a silent G, Nikki Druce, as we explore these stories and hundreds more as I uncover the darker side to London's history in macabre London. If you're interested in historic true crime, uprisings, crime and punishment, and the occasional haunting, then tune in now and join me in taking a butcher's at the past. You can find Macabre London wherever you get your podcasts and also on YouTube for a hosted version of the show. Come and join the Ghoul Gang and let me guide you through the terrifying history they never would have taught you at school. Cheerio! Okay, so for this next segment, what's hilarious is I was trying so hard to make it a Mother Nature segment, as I've told Ashley, but really it fits in with End of the World. It mm-hmm. has the same vibe, so <laughs> it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel, I feel. Okay. been better. <laughs> but I wrote a poem, so can I still read it for Mother Nature? Yeah. <laughs> so when I th- yeah, you big fucking nerd, read your poem. <laughs> when I th- When I thought this was going to be a Mother Nature segment, this is what I wrote. A poem. Mother Nature is beautiful, 
Mother Nature is sometimes rude. Mother Nature wants you to frolic in her fields in the nude. Mother Nature is wild, but Mother Nature is free. Mother Nature sometimes becomes unhinged and acts like a bee. Let's take care of our planet. Let's take care of our mother. So we don't keep getting crazy storms that make us run for cover. Mother Nature! <laughs> that was my poem. Honestly, I'm ready for the full book of poetry. It's so stupid. No, and no, also, that's, that, that touched me deep. That touched me deep. <laughs> Uh, there were two poems, and I'm sad I deleted the other one because I don't remember it. There was also a natural disasters poem, but then I went towards Mother Nature. But this was all also inspired by my love for Twister, starring Bill Paxton, <laughs> long live my man, who I didn't know was dead until you and Amy so told me once. So okay. sorry. That was a really rough <sighs> moment. <It was> awful. <laughs> um, anyway, but this is, it's the end of the world as we know it, where the weather just went wild and combined with something that humans really like to do to the world, mm -hmm. add pollution. So kind of just this crazy freak accident that happened. And it's, it's also shorter. I know I went on forever with my true crime, but here we go. It's also interesting, just FYI, that you and I, maybe you didn't find it on this day, but I found this story yesterday and I didn't read all of it. I just read like the first like a little bit and I was like, ooh, fascinating. And I put it on a list for like a future episode. And then you text you and I texted like literally four hours later and you brought this up and you were like, I'm thinking about uh -huh. doing that. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? I literally just put this on my list today. And this is from when? What year? 1948. Yeah. OK, so it's not like a new thing. Go on. No, not at all. Well, and what's funny, I think this is next episode, so I won't say what the topic is, but an event that you're talking about, um, I think it's next episode. I That was also on my list when I was trying to find like natural disaster type things, and luckily I checked the spreadsheet for that one and was like, no way, because <laughs> it was either <laughs> going to be that or like two other things, but I just, we are, we're in sync, guys. We're the same person. Okay, so during our favorite season in 1948, spooky season, mm. October 26th, um, a very spooky villain came to Pennsylvania in the form of a fog that settled over the town of Denora, Donora, sorry to everyone in Pennsylvania, I Denora, Alex didn't know either, so mm. it's fine. Denora? I'm going to go with Denora, it sounds better, it sounds like a name. I think so too. Denora, Pennsylvania. A fog settled over the town which was home to the U.S. Steel Corporation's Denora Zinc Works and American Steel and Wire. And, you know, this is not too far from Pittsburgh, which is also Steel City, so yeah. not surprising. As the day wore on, this fog became progressively thicker, and witnesses in the town claimed that it was so thick and potent they could taste it. And a few residents said it Ugh. felt like when they opened their mouth, they could take some of it in and almost chew it. It's so thick, what the which fuck? is awful. And it stuck around. By October 29th, the town had trapped so much of this fog, this smoky, thick fog, that attendees of a local high school football game, they were still going to football games, even though no one could see, noted that they couldn't see the players, but they could hear them. So they still wanted to go and support them. How the hell were these people playing how, football? I was going to say, how did the players see the players? They had to have just been crashing. Who knows where the ball just landed? I don't understand, but they played. Um, doctors realized this isn't good, and they ordered all of the elderly and those who had trouble breathing to leave town as soon as possible. And then what was even worse was those people tried to leave town, but there was no visibility. It was reduced to nothing, so they couldn't even leave town. Even firefighters had to abandon attempts to deliver oxygen to suffering citizens Jesus. as they were unable to navigate the town in the middle of the day with, like, all the streetlights on. Couldn't see a thing. So it was very sad. And then on the morning of October 30th, the two U.S. steel plants finally ceased operation. And what's gross is they were asked to cease, like, when this first started happening because it was yeah. just assumed, like, this has to be from you guys. Like, what is all this smoke doing? And they were like, we don't want to. But yeah, they did. They were like, no, it couldn't be us. It can't be us. We're the reason this town exists. Shut up. So they did cease operation. And then the following morning, the fog had begun to dissipate finally. So, yeah, shut up, guys. Yeah, once shocker. Again. 
But unfortunately, even though it was dissipating, which is great, it did leave many surviving residents with permanent respiratory damage. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, 20 of the residents of this small town did pass away, which is very sad. Wow. So what's happening here? Because the steel mill, you know, it had been running already. So it's like, yeah, it wasn't we've brand been new. through this before. Why is it suddenly filling us with smoke? But early on October 26th, an anti-cyclone traded places with a regular old East Coast storm over western Pennsylvania, over Denora. And an anti-cyclone is exactly what you think, opposite of a cyclone. Instead of a concentrated low pressure system, an anticyclone can cover large areas and consist of high pressure system, which drags air down. And so the air can just kind of like sit and ah. it'll be really cold air instead of usually warm air that we get closer to the surface. So that's what was happening with this anticyclone coming through and drawing air downwards in a clockwise motion. This natural phenomena doesn't always cause death. It can just, it can occur and be like, a little storm. Right. But if but the it was air combined, they're pushing down is poison. <laughs> when it's poison. When it takes the toxic poison. Um, yeah. When combined with the location and industrial nature of Denora, the ensuing unnatural weather occurrence wreaked havoc on this poor town's air supply and nobody stood a chance. So Gosh. also the way Denora is nestled in into Pennsylvania. It's nestled in the Monongahela River Valley. Mm. So because it's down in a valley, that also wasn't helping right. them. So the air is moving down and then just kind of getting trapped stuck. in a bowl, essentially. So they were just stuck. And it was a huge, strong temperature inversion that without stopping the toxic fumes that were coming into the air, like there was just no chance because the air was sitting there and nobody could do anything about it. But this... Fortunately, as I said, got cleared up in a few days, but if they hadn't been able to clear it up, like thousands could have died like this. Yeah. It was so toxic. And even the people who didn't have breathing problems, if they had just gone a few more days, probably just would have fallen over dead. It would have swept the whole town. Um, so that is very scary. But this, the exciting thing about this death fog, as it has been coined, is that it led to so many clean air changes you know yeah. like politics politics changed forever after this and it's a really small town i think that's what is the coolest is it isn't the pittsburgh famous steel city it's a right. it's a smaller town outside of pittsburgh um but finally this reached national news on december 13th 1948 later that same year and it was revealed that the victims of the smog fog toxic smoke whatever you want to call it were experiencing acute fluorine poisoning determined by extreme fluorine levels in the blood of the deceased 25 times the normal level that you're supposed to have and then all of the breathing problems that carried on with even the people that survived who probably didn't live as long of lives as they should have and made people highly sensitive for the rest of their lives. So this is finally reaching national news. We finally have an answer of exactly what was being inhaled. And when it's brought to, you know, politicians, they're saying, okay, we have to make a change in this. So yeah, we have to make sure this shit doesn't happen again. <laughs> shut it down. There's Then we find out as we're starting to explore more and talk to scientists, like, what should we do? We find out it happened over in Belgium in another river valley in 1930 where 63 people perished. And in 1950, 22 people died in Poza Damn. Rica, Mexico. And we've heard of probably on this same night that we were looking at the story, the London fog. London yeah. had its death fog. Um, the infamous London fog claimed 4,000 lives over the course of five days. So... When this all started happening, that's when we were able to pass new laws. In 1955, the Air Pollution Control Act happened. And then in 1963, the Clean Air Act was passed. And in 1959, Pennsylvania passed legislation to prevent the pollution of the air by any smoke, dust, gases, odors, mist, vapors. And, you know, then there was a huge cap put on all of these steel places. But Environmental Protection Agency that was formed in 1970 by President Nixon all kind of came because of this small little town in Pennsylvania. And they are so proud of it, as they should be, that there is a Denora Smog Museum in this teeny tiny town. And their That's tagline smog. is, clean air started here. Oh. And you can go and look at like the history and everything that happened. So, yeah. How terrifying. I love that they're like, uh, we still tried to go to the football game. I wouldn't go 
I wouldn't even peek outside. I know. I actually, <laughs> I wanted to share that because I thought it was so cute. Not cute because they were right. destroying they were their lungs, but cute of like the small town. Yeah. Like we can't miss the ball I think game. What... Friday Night Lights. <laughs> Let's go. Um, yeah, I I thought that was cute in a way, wow. but also like you guys could have died stay or maybe. Inside. I know. Don't go out there. So very strange and like so rare the chances of it happening, but it was just the right combo. Yeah, but listen, it obviously can. It's happened or it had happened multiple times before that. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's why pollution is the worst. And we take care of our mother earth, as I said in my beautiful poem at the beginning of this. We got to care for her. What was the name of this event? Denora Death Fog. Denora Death Fog, which is also mm-hmm. my band name. <laughs> I, right? It would be the coolest death metal <laughs> band like, ever. Denora Death Fog. It's the Denora Death Fog. Uh, okay, to wrap up the episode, I have one more story, and this is going to be a segment that I like to call Terrifying Technology. Beep, 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 As per usual, when I bring a terrifying technology update, this both sucks real bad, but is also pretty incredible. So, okay, I have to thank our lawyer and my BFF and longtime friend of the podcast, Andrew Miller, Andrew. for texting me this nightmare fuel a few weeks ago. Thanks, Andrew, for keeping me in the loop. Thanks, Andrew. Here we go. Literally going to read this line from a Vox article that you can find a link for in the description of this episode. Um, The line reads, With the help of AI, scientists from the University of Texas at Austin have developed a technique that can translate people's brain activity into actual speech. It is not theoretical. It has been tested. It works. We can officially read minds. Okay, that's cool, and I've always wanted to be a mind reader, but I'm scared. Yeah, it's I, I, cool I don't, that. I, I, are we it's ready for possible? This? Sucks that it is happening. So this yeah. isn't quite Ooh. new. In the past, researchers did find that they could decode unspoken language by implanting electrodes into our brains, and then using an algorithm that reads the brain activity and translates it into text but it was pretty invasive you had to have surgery Mm -hmm. implant electrodes into your brain um and it also wasn't that great like they could tell when you were tired or they could translate a few short little snippets here and there now however there is a non-invasive brain computer interface or bci that can decode continuous language in the brain so someone could literally read what our minds were thinking without ever hearing a word no and all it takes yeah. mm. is an mri machine and chat gpt baby that's it Ugh, chat gpt just all it takes really making us scared and fascinated <laughs> so, all the time And I can explain to you exactly how it works. It's pretty interesting. So the MRI machine will measure the blood flow. Blood (laughs) flow. Blood flow. Will measure the blood flow to different areas of the brain. So what they did was they took three participants and that had them lay in these MRI machines, MRI scanners, and had them listen to 16 hours worth of storytelling podcasts. While they were listening to these podcasts, their brains were scanned to track the change in blood flow. And using that data, plus the transcripts of these podcasts, they were able to use an AI model to associate a phrase with how each person's brain looks when it hears that phrase. Now, the number of possible word sequences is basically infinite. So... They used ChatGPT to narrow down the possible sequences to predict which words are the li- are likeliest to come next in a sequence, sort of like our auto auto 
whatever predictor text when you're texting. Oh yeah, and it can the like correct. Yeah, like, but yeah. like you can like I think choose. you're meaning this. Yeah, you're <laughs> exactly. But it will like suggest things like could, should, would. Mm. Yeah. So the result of that is that the brain decoder gets the gist right, even though it doesn't always nail every single word. The message still gets across. So, for okay. example, and I have a graphic I'll show for those of you watching on YouTube. When the brain stimulus was this sentence, I got up from the air mattress and pressed my face against the glass of the bedroom window, expecting to see eyes staring back at me, but instead finding only darkness. The decoded message was... I just continued to walk up to the window and open the glass. I stood on my toes and peered out and I didn't see anything and looked up again. I saw nothing. So like not word for word, not as poetic. But close. But the general message came Quite through just close. fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, or Ew. here's another one. The message was, or the words were, I don't have my driver's license yet, and I just jumped out right when I needed to. And she says, well, why don't you come back to my house, and I'll give you a ride. I say, okay. The decoded message from the brain was, she is not ready. She has not even started to learn to drive yet. I had to push her out of the car. I said, we will take her home now, and she agreed. So again, like, same thing, mm -hmm. just like different right, words. same, same. Same, as, same, but different. As we get more advanced yeah. AI systems, this will only become more and more detailed and specific and get it right. Right. But a portable BCI machine is still a long way away from being a reality. Right now you have to use an MRI, which is about a 3 to $4 million machine. So not likely to yeah. be something a lot of people have access to. Right. But... The decoding approach could definitely be adapted for portable systems that are more affordable. So people who are paralyzed or vegetative or possibly even comatose, depending on what's going on in there, may be able to communicate with their doctors and families again. So oh, that is the amazing that. part. <laughs> yes. That is incredible. Yeah, I like that part. And that connects to the the thing that I talked about on here of like learning that people's brains are still active when they're in a vegetative state. Yeah. And everyone's always wondering like, can they hear us? And we've learned that they can, but this would finally be a way to maybe get a possibly talk of that, which would be incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now the uh, scary part comes in when this technology has advanced to the point that it, the everyday person can afford it or implements it in their everyday life to control their computers and our phones with our brains. Right. We would have to come up with so many new human rights laws and restrictions to protect us from companies who have access to our literal brain data. Like they already have access mm. to our browsing data, they already listen through our devices, right. they target us for marketing and advertisements, you but imagine my brain. if they were using no. our brain data to do the same you have thing. To get out. Get out of here. Get out of my brain. No. Nightmare. Like and then there's also a scenario that the government would use BCIs for surveillance or the police would use it for interrogations. That's terrifying. Literally like, like pre-crime minority report shit. Like just because you think about yeah. killing your boss doesn't mean you're planning to kill your boss. Right, but if that thought comes out, then it's like, oh, well, you did it because yeah. I, well, you it were came by. It. It's here on the decoder. I don't like. I it. mean, I do think if you fantasize about killing a person, maybe a trip to the doctor wouldn't be a horrible idea. But also, it's not. <gasps> well, a crime. sure. Well, sure. So, yeah. Right. Welcome to wow, uh, the future. Both, yeah, terrifying and cool all at once. I mean, every time I hear about AI in the slightest, that's how I feel yeah. like chat GPT is like it's incredible that this exists in our lifetime but then I'm also like no too <laughs> no far. we can't do this we can't, do we this. can't live like this I don't want yeah. every tv show from here on out to be written by an you know AI it's mm -hmm. partially why the writer's strike yeah. is happening right now because I know certain jobs can be replaced with a program like ChatGPT, um, which is and it 
it's scary rough. in that way, but also like I love what all of the people have come out to say about it. Writers, especially, as they're you know posting on social media about the strike and why it's important to them. Of like, AI is never going to get the full feeling and emotion. Like maybe they'll they'll get a general idea, and yes, could they put out an episode of a show? I'm sure they could, but like you still need the human experience and. A lot of writers, one woman posted on Instagram, I wish I could say what her name was and tag her, maybe after the fact I'll find it, but she was saying she's been through so much trauma in her life, and part of the reason she's a great writer is because of the trauma that yeah. she's been through, and it's like, AI doesn't know my trauma, they don't know how to express an experience through that, and I was like, yes, damn right. Yeah. You can't just give the robots Well, I mean, everything. it's very hard to replace, like, manual labor and the arts with artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. You know, we could replace with artificial yep. intelligence the producers that make billions of dollars and the heads Isn't of these companies. That, that could yeah. easily be replaced by AI. Not the that, artists that I'm okay who, with. you know, no. make the art. No. Good God. Making the art. A thousand percent, Ashley. <sighs> Preach. Preach. That's all the time we have this week for Keep It Weird. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you don't mind, while you're here, give us a five-star rating if you like what you've heard. Uh, follow us on social media at Keep It Weirdcast. Join our Facebook groups and pages, all of that. Like this video, click subscribe so you can be the first to know when a new video is uploaded to our YouTube channel. And as usual, please, please, consider donating to our patreon it's how we make Please. any and all money on this show you can donate one five or ten dollars a month or a one-time fifty dollar donation to secure yourself a sponsored segment and in return you get bonus episodes discounts on merchandise and a newsletter on the last day of every month and that's a great place to keep up with upcoming weird or creepy movie tv video game news uh, like we were saying earlier, we have a true crime segment. We have a strange news segment. I always add in some real life scary stories. Sometimes we share easy spells. Sometimes we link you to really scary creepy pasta stories. It's a really good time. And all you have to do is give us $5 and you'll get that newsletter. You'll get an extra episode of the show. It's a fucking sweet deal, okay? Literally cheaper than a it Starbucks is. coffee. For all that and we're content. really giving you fire content, jam-packed. Oh, yeah. It's worth it. Oh, yeah. But for now, the bees are back in town. 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 Okay, bzz, bzz, bzz. we are sticking with our tried and true flashing method because it's gosh darn diddly dang worked for us four times in a row. So let's see if we can get it again. No pressure. I am, <laughs> yeah, seriously. I was thinking about that today. I was like, I feel like I'm going to put a lot of pressure on myself to like get it to, you know, work. Uh, That's how I felt too. But, anyways, we're still using the Zener cards. <gasps> Here's these uh, symbols Beautiful. right here. Today, I'm sending it to Lauren. Ready? Yes. Okay, I'm going to send it to yes. you right now. Squiggly lines? Oh, no. Oh. No. Star. It was a star. The devil star. The devil. We've never gotten close. star. Uh, we every haven't. time we every it's time we I'm use a star, about. we can't get it. What is it? What's going on with this? I know something about the star is blocking us, blocking our connection. You know what? <sighs> Next week we'll try that again. We'll try the flashing method again. If if we don't get it, then maybe we need to to add a a, a new thing to our another trick psychic abilities. It'll tell us if our luck has run out with our flashing. It will. But in the meantime, <sighs> Fine. hope you guys have a lovely week and that you're always keeping it weird. Keep it weird. Ding.